Today we have a very special guest, lead singer of the band Candlebox, Kevin Martin. What's up, Kevin? Hello, how are you? I'm good. Now, we're, the occasion is that you're doing the Candlebox farewell year, our months, our period, whatever you want to call it here. Uh, you've got uh, the new, by, by the way, this will come out. So the new album is out. The new album is out. Um, yeah. The Long Goodbye. And you're now touring with Three Doors Down as kind of the the, the, <laughs> the swan song, uh, seeing all all the songs that 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 fans love. Let's talk about the album first. The long goodbye. First, did you know was how much of an, how long in advance did you know that like how did the planning of oh this this farewell album how did it come together how did you plan for this. Well, we had started talking about it, <clears throat> excuse me, in uh, 2021, uh, when we started touring again, we st I started discussing with the guys the fact that I was going to be wrapping things up in 2023, the 30th anniversary of the debut album. And, um, and then I was just kind of putting Candlebox away. Um, so we started discussing it back in 2021. We started writing in 2022. Um, we did two recording sessions to finish up the demos in September and October. 22 and then went in the studio and and started working on them in march of 24 so or 23 rather so it was actually you know a good, good period of time working on the stuff and making sure that it was where we wanted it to be but it was also you know we wanted to make sure that that um musically there was freedom in the songs that we were working on so there was no um there was no real structure that we put in place to, to work on it which is not you know that's not normal for us normally we will We'll sit down and we'll start working on songs individually and then we'll bring them into one another and then we'll try to develop them from there what we did with this record was we just did it all together the five of us in a room and um and that was a beautiful experience i hadn't done that since the debut album oh really so normally the, your process is you know you, you you everyone writes separately and you come together for the album which it usually works yep yeah, exactly. And I think that's how most bands do it anyways. You know, there's either one main songwriter or whatever. And in our case, you know, I've always been the, the, the lyricist of the band. Right. Um, right. But in this situation, um, I, wor I worked with um, four or five other actual lyricists in Nashville, which was amazing. I enjoyed, I enjoyed that beyond belief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's another question I have is because it is the final Candlebox album. Was there things on here that you wanted to try? Or were there songs from 10 years ago that you were like kind of working on and you like brought up or like how did how did you come up with the track list for the final Candlebox album no we were we were very conscious to to only use songs that we wrote um in those two writing sessions um so we had 18 songs to choose from we ended up recording 13 which there's another five out there floating around that we could finish up at some point uh maybe release on a you know uh, -side extra situation. final yeah something yeah. like that who knows but um yeah no we we just we really um, just went into it knowing that this is how it was going to be. So yeah, we tried a ton of stuff. There's so much piano on this record. And that's yeah, one of the that's things what that- I was gonna say is there's just in, in terms of musicality, there's just a lot of variety here. It's not, yeah. there are some songs that look rock hard. Like you think of a candle box, classic candle box song. And there's some that are almost like funky, almost like borderline, you know, um, a, a lot of upbeat kind of stuff, but then, and then you kind of got the more slow stuff. So um, my favorite song, I don't know if it's got a strange, I love Elegant or Elegante. I don't know if you- Elegante. Know. Elegante, there we go. Um, yeah. To me, that sounds, your vocal on that is amazing. I love your vocal oh, on thank that. You. And thank you. I feel like that is one song that people who have been following Candlebox since the 90s, that's one song that I think that'll kind of feel like a classic Candlebox sort of, sort of arrangement. Do you have yeah, a personal favorite from it? Elegante is my personal favorite right now. Oh, really? Um, okay. So yeah, I have the yeah. taste then. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's 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 literally my favorite song on the record. I love everything about it. I love the mood that it creates. I love the you know, the sexual innuendos of the song. Um, I think that it's it's super cool. And I, I do think, I agree with you. I think a lot of people are going to be, um, are going to gravitate towards that because it has that kind of classic Candlebox feel to it, maybe from um, the debut and, and Happy Pills more so than Lucy. But um, yeah, it's it's it was a really fun record to make, and that song actually was written in a sound check. Um, oh, really? That yeah, that summer of twenty one. So we we had that one just sitting and ready to go, and I was like, but like you know, for example, songs like um, Foxy. 
you know, that's a, that was entirely inspired by The Cure and um, a young artist out of Canada by the name of uh, Ecstasy. And we wanted to incorporate these two kinds of bright, um, beautiful, melodic, dark, moody um, images and, and uh, elements of songwriting into that song. But we wanted a lighter kind of um, emotional, lyrical attachment to it. So, and Foxy's a term I've been using since I was a kid. Um, it, I it's think just Foxy's a fun, I, I remember when I was a kid, uh, Wayne's World, Foxy Lady was yeah. big, you know? Yeah. 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 So, you know, it's just a word that I've used since I was a kid. And and I was like, I'm going to use this in a song. And and we wrote a song that, um, that I felt, oh, this is a perfect song for the title. Right, right, right. Um, and the, the last track, um, Hourglass, I love it. I think it's a good ending track. It's, is it kind of weird to think like, how did you end up with that specific track for like the final track on the final album? Does it feel good to you to have that one at the end? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's a perfect way, you know, opening with punks and closing with hourglass is just, it's the perfect bookends. Um, it's a, it's a career, you know, um, that's what this album kind of does over the 10 songs that are on the digital release. It just gives you an idea of my 30 years of being a touring musician, um, and a, and a, you know, songwriter for 30, well, for longer than 30 years as a songwriter, but, um, and, and I think that, bookends are, are very important to albums um like our debut album opening with don't you and ending with he calls home it was a it was a similar idea when we were doing the track listing for this but i mean hourglass was just an obvious closer um you know the hourglass is breaking time is running out you know the sand is running out i mean that's what happens in life you know and, and we've all experienced those emotions where we realize that maybe this is you know, the end of, uh, of, of everything that we've ever known. We've had that, you know, in high school, you have your first heartbreak, um, you know, in college, you have your, you know, your, your first breakup or whatever it is, you know, I mean, it's, it, it, life is just a strange thing. And, um, and I've had an absolute blast with this career for 30 years. So um, to close out with, with Hourglass is just the obvious. Are you still going to make music after this? What are your plans for life after Candlebox ends? <laughs> I won't make any more records. Um, I've been asked to produce three records next year. Um, I, I'm certain that I'll somehow be involved in, in this musical industry. I'm not sure what that's going to be, but you know, I have this foundation called Riptide Society, which is uh, takes up a, a lot of my time. That's for at-risk youth and, and young adults in the foster care system. So I'll be playing shows for that. And if anybody ever asks me to play for a charity or something, I'll, I'll certainly do that. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll get out there and play a show, but I'm never going to tour again. And I'm never going to make Candlebox records again. And I don't even know if I'll make Kevin Martin music again. I, I, I'm, I don't love it the way I used to. Um, and that's a weird feeling, but at the same time, um, I'm grateful that I had, you know, love for it for 54 years. Well, you know, there is something refreshing about kind of going out gracefully rather than being one of those, musicians who's grumpy and doesn't like appearing on things and sort of, you know, I, 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 I respect this whole, this whole move. And I, and I think it's, I think it's kind of refreshing. Thank you, man. Thank you. Um, no, I, I would be, people would be, would be kind of disappointed if I didn't talk about classic Candlebox stuff. And what I'm interested most in, um, I'm not going to ask you to tell a story, um, behind your, your biggest songs or anything like that. But, um, when you guys were first coming in, when you guys were putting together the, uh, the debut album, the, the self-titled album, um, that was like the height of grunge of Pearl Jam and Nirvana, early 90s. How much, how much was commercialism and getting hits on your mind at the time versus just making a cool record? Well, um, I don't think we, none of us really knew how to write a hit song. Um, and back then, I mean, you know, to, Seattle was such a, a beautiful city when it was come, you know, when it comes to the music that it was creating. Um, it allowed you the opportunity to um, to kind of play what you wanted. I mean, it, Seattle was so kind of like a, a tiny little New York um, from the '70s, where you could just create whatever music you wanted, and people would come see you play it, and, and they loved it, and they were so inspired by what you were doing that they would start a band, or or you would start playing shows together. And it was it was really the camaraderie in that city was amazing when it came to the musicality of it. So I think for us, it was really being being that we were five years in age younger than like the guys in Alice in Chains or the guys in Pearl Jam. Um, you know, we're still in high school and stuff when those records were coming out. Right. Um, 
you kind of had to fight for a place in in the musical community. Um, so with, when it came to Peter Barty, Scott, and I creating these songs, it was very similar to what we do, what we did with this record, where we didn't really stop ourselves from going where we wanted to go. It just so happened that that's the direction that the four of us wanted to go, and we found it. I don't know how. I mean, it's mm-hmm. literally the happiest accident the four of us could ever have because. Right. We, we didn't know one another. We weren't friends prior to the band. We were kind of put together by our producer, Kelly Gray, um, and it grew from there. So the fact that, you know, four guys that don't have a single idea about what one another does create an album that sells 7 million records worldwide is shocking to me still to this day. Um, so I, I don't know if hits were on our mind because none of us knew what a hit song or did was. Did you feel? Let me rephrase it. Did you feel pressure because this was the the era of MTV? No, and you, you didn't no, feel didn't. label pressure or anything like that. No, because it, like I said, there was so much freedom in that city to create what you wanted, so it it didn't really matter. I mean, we didn't think you know, we didn't think we were going to get signed. Um, we had right. friends and bands that were better than us that, that you know, weren't getting signed. We, we thought, you know, for sure Sweetwater or Green Apple Quickstep were going to be snatched up right after Nirvana or Pearl Jam. Um, and of course they were eventually, but um, it just, it, it didn't happen that way. So you didn't really think to yourself, I've got to write a hit song in order to get a label to pay attention. We, the labels were already in Seattle. Everybody was already looking at the city. So if you had any kind of good music, you were going to get an opportunity to perform it live. I mean, there were so many bands that came out that were better than us that never achieved any kind of r- remote success like Candlebox did. So it's still very, very shocking to me. But mm-hmm. the beauty of it is, is that that lack of feeling pressure is why you've got the mu- the music that came from that city that you've got. And that's why everybody loves it still, because there's an honesty and a sincerity to it because we didn't give a shit. You know, we weren't trying to write hit songs. We weren't right. trying to fit into the mold. And that's why every record that came out that's you know remotely good is still considered grunge or a great part of the Seattle history. Yeah. How do, how do you feel about the term grunge? Did you, did you guys feel like people labeled you that? Did you even care? You know? I mean, that didn't come along until, you know, I think it was uh, the, Rolling Stone magazine or something came by and that girl made it up in the offices of, of Sub Pop. I can't remember. Catherine, I think was her name, but you know, um, it's, it's just a funny, it's a funny word that, you know, I mean, it's, the guys were grungy. We, I mean, we wore Doc Martens and shorts and long johns and we're bike messengers and we probably stunk. So, I mean, it's the perfect term, but yeah. Right. Um, but it, it just, it was like the label that they gave you. And I, you know, Candlebox was always just a rock and roll band. I mean, I've always yeah, thought I that. Never felt, I never, when I never felt that just because there was a Seattle connection, just because you had long hair, uh, that, that meant grunge, I guess. I, I don't know. Right. Yeah. I it's a strange word. Candlebox more of like a, just like a hard rock band of, yeah. than anything else. So exactly. but did, did you, did you have like, this sounds cliche, but did you, did you have rock star dreams? Did you, did you, Oh, every kid does and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, man. I had piss, kiss pictures all over my walls. Um, oh, you were a kiss guy, a huge kiss fan. And then I went and saw them and they got back together in the nineties and I laughed my ass off. I was like, I can't believe I ever thought this was cool. Um, but you know, I mean, that's what you learn when you're a kid. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it, it's, I was a drummer and that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be John Bonham. Um, I wanted to be Neil Peart. I wanted to be Topper Hedden. I wanted to be Keith Moon. You know, that's that's what I wanted to be in a band. Right. I never right. wanted to be a lead singer until I went and saw Midnight Oil perform on my 18th birthday and it scared the shit out of me. I said, oh, that's what I want to do. Midnight Oil was the band that did it for you. Wow. Yeah. 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 Do you do you listen to new stuff now or do you like when you listen to all I listen to? Uh, oh, yeah. I'm listening to yeah, I'm listening to the new labyrinth. Um, I love him. I think he's incredibly talented. I love the beauty, the landscape that he creates in his music. Um, there's a band out of Canada that I'm I'm, I'm fascinated with called the Blue Stones. Um, I'm listening to the '69. You know, I love new music. I, I'm, and I love the alternative world. I'm not crazy about the rock and roll that's coming out right now. I find it to be very very boring and 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 um, and cookie derivative. cutter. And I think it's kind yeah. of derivative. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it, well, it has to be. I mean, because it's the only way you're going to get on radio is if you've got a hit yeah. from last year, you've got to create the same fucking song. And 
that's why rock radio is in the position it's in. Yeah, rock radio painted itself into a corner. If you listen to any rock station, you're going to hear 20 year old Foo Fighters songs, 20 year old Strokes songs. Um, they might as well call it classic rock, and it's really hard yeah. for a newer act to get on the radio. That's a whole nother, whole nother discussion for a whole other time, but uh, something yeah. I've, I've encountered a lot. But I feel like there's when I've seen bands in person, a lot of bands recently, what I call they do a historic recreation of of rock or um, that's you know, of pop punk or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I and, and I've, I've literally been in shows recently with younger artists, um, you know, in the in the late in their late teens, early twenties, who will call for a mosh pit. You cannot call for a mosh pit. It happens or it doesn't, you know? So exactly. anyway, yeah. that's, that's all, that's all my highest. Um, so you, you got this tour. Um, so what's the, you're, you're touring with three doors down. Have you, do you guys know those, do you know that band from uh, for a while? I mean, they've, they've obviously been around for a while too. Yeah. I've been friends with Brad and, and um, Greg and Chris um, for going on 20 years. Greg actually was my drummer when I was, in, when I had the high Watts um, prior to him joining puddle of mud. So he was my drummer. Um, I uh, started working with him right after he left Chris Cornell um, and Brad, I met on their away from the sun record release, which is 20 years ago this year. So, so yeah, that's how long I've known them and, and Chris as well. I mean, we've played shows with those guys for years. We've talked about touring together for about the past 10 years. It just never seemed to come around. And and so lucky that this is my way of, of kind of wrapping things up. It's a, I mean, we're playing to five to 15,000 people a night, you know, that's an amazing yeah. experience. And, and, um, and we're loving every minute of it, man. Chet, their guitar player gets up and jams with us. And you know, it's, it's a blast. Yeah. Really enjoying it. I love the guys. I mean, Brad and I are just, we're the, we're the best of friends. We don't discuss politics, which is, you know, that's totally fine. You know, his opinions, his mine's mine. Right. Um, and we're on opposite ends of the spectrum. I appreciate that. I feel like we're yeah. in a world where people feel like they can't work together if their politics don't align. And I think that's, that kind of stinks. Well, I'm seeing yeah. a lot of that in our messages. Oh, I can't believe you're touring with three doors down. They, they're absolutely, absolutely against what you believe. And I was like, well, that's the beauty of politics. That's the beauty of life. Is it if, if you can work together uh, and you're on different ends of the spectrum, what better way to make it happen? You know I mean? It's like, just don't discuss what your opinions are because listen, your opinions, your opinions and everybody's right. fucking got one. And it doesn't mean that it's right. And, and it doesn't mean you, you should be out there voicing it on every single platform that you have. My opinion is my opinion. And I respect Brad's opinions. I respect Republicans. I respect Democrats. I respect independents. As long as you have, a, you know, a, a directive where you understand that everybody's entitled to that opinion and everybody's entitled to live the same life that you want to live on your own equally. So that's it. Exactly. Love it. Love it. Yeah. That's my two cents. <laughs> I, yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate, I appreciate that view. I appreciate the attitude in general. So what does a candle box tour look like now versus 30 years ago? Were you guys much of a party band back in the day? <laughs> There's a, <laughs> <laughs> There's a bunch of strollers on the bus. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, we, it's, it's a lot different. No, we weren't partiers. I mean, there was a period where, you know, um, things got out a, a little out of hand with a couple of the guys in the band. I was never that kind of a person. I've always been, you know, sit, sit and drink my whiskey and, and kind of keep myself uh, calm and quiet. But um, no, we, we've always been kind of a very, um, we travel comfortably and, um, casually, we're all on the same bus. We don't split up and get our own buses. We don't do any of that sort of thing. It's and I, and I love these guys that I play with. BJ, Brian, Island, and Adam are my best friends, and and my crew, Carlos and James are are and Connor, our merch merch guy. I mean, we are literally we are like nine brothers. It's crazy. We 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 just really enjoy one another and one another's company, and that's kind of the that's kind of what happens. We get off stage, we get on the bus and we start talking. We may play a little bit of PlayStation five, you know, or something like that. Yeah. But we, we sit around and we listen to music and we talk and, and we share life experiences and things that have gone on with us for our days and stuff. It's pretty rad. I love it. That's great. I'm, I'm glad you're really enjoying, enjoying the experience. Uh, I know you got to go. I'll get you out on this. Um, everyone knows, you know, the, the big candle box songs, but is there a song maybe deep catalog or maybe one you wish you would have released as a single that you know you would that it's as a personal favorite that's maybe not one of the more five or ten most played camel box songs yeah um on disappearing airports i think turn your heart around 
um, or not sorry, on uh, Love Stories and Other Musings, Turn Your Heart Around is a, is a really, uh, such a cool song. Um, that record for us, Love Stories is super interesting. We didn't, it wasn't our idea to put the, the five cover songs on it. That was our management's idea, which was, I think was stupid. That's why they got fired. But, mm-hmm. um, cause we had done those songs. We had done those covers for Activision was gonna do Seattle Rock Band. So they gave, they paid us to do re-record our five hits. Right. Um, and, and they were just supposed to be for Activision and the manager's like, well, we're going to put them on the record. I was like, you do that. You're fired. If you put them on the record, you got fired. But, um, yeah, so I think love stories for us is a really super cool album. And there's so many tracks on that record that could have been special singles. And, but turn your heart around. is just a really spectacular song. I wrote that with Chris Daughtry. He's a good friend of mine. We actually wrote it for him. He didn't use it. So I, I said, Hey, do you mind if I use a track? And he said, no, go ahead. So that, I'm glad I got to use it because I love that song. And on yeah. disappearing airports, um, there's a B side called all that we got, which is a piano piece that, um, I don't even know where I can find it now. I don't even have it on my phone. I thought I had all the copies of it, but that was a song called, um, all that we got. It was written in the vein of, of, a uh, kind of a queen meets, um, green day ballad. Um, which is really beautiful. I love that song. Um, so yeah, there's, there's several in our catalog that, that um, I thought should have been singles or people should have heard, but you know, um, maybe someday we'll release a box set of, you know, the hundred songs that we have yeah. and you can listen to all of them. Right. Right. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the show and congratulations on the album. And I hope you enjoy what's left of the tour and um, congratulations on, on the career. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. It's been, been a pleasure chatting with you.